massive nuclear submarine is advancing through the waters of the Arctic. This is the Kursk, the pride of the Russian fleet, valued at a billion dollars. The entire country is eager the purpose of these exercises is to restore faith in the Federation's might. At 9 p.m., the Kursk submarine undergoes its final technical checks at the secret military port of Zapadnai Litsi. Designed to attack American carrier battle groups, the submarine represents the latest achievement in Russian defense. The Kursk is equipped with two nuclear reactors, measures 150 meters in length, and is as tall as a six-story building. It is nearly twice the size of a commercial jetliner. Its unique double hull design and nine watertight compartments mean that the submarine can survive a direct torpedo hit and remain intact. Lieutenant Captain Dmitry Kolesnikov smokes his last cigarette before boarding. He is 27 years old and misses his young wife, Olga. They married just four months ago, in April 2000, and had a modest wedding. Shortly after the wedding, Dmitry showed Olga the Kursk. He wanted her to feel the same confidence in the submarine that he did. She was not prepared for how enormous it would be. The tour began with the torpedo compartment, next to the command center. Towards the aft, Dmitry showed Olga the propulsion control center, where he was in command. They then visited the more unusual parts of the Kursk, the sauna, and the swimming pool. Olga understood why Dmitry was so happy on the Kursk. The submarine had two escape hatches and a rescue capsule with a propulsion system large enough to evacuate the entire crew at once. Olga felt assured that Dmitry was aboard one of the safest submarines in naval history. At 9.30 p.m., Dmitry joined his crew. Although their task was a 15-day exercise, the Kursk crew was always ready for real combat. The submarine bristled with weapons it had 24 cruise missiles and launch silos on either side of the keel, and the bow contained the torpedo compartment with six torpedo tubes and room for 24 torpedoes. Crew member Momen Gadjiev, a torpedo specialist, was tasked with monitoring the experimental torpedo armament. Gadjiev was from Dagestan, bordering the restive Chechen region. At 10.30 p.m., in the twilight of the Arctic summer evening, the Kursk set out to sea. It was Friday, August 11th. In the Barents Sea, 140 kilometers from shore, naval exercises were in full swing. The Kursk would participate in mock attacks on Russian ships simulating American ones. The submarine's commander, Captain Gennady Lyakin, was a bold product of the Soviet system and one of the most experienced men in the Navy. At 2 p.m., the crew prepared to launch cruise missiles. Their target was the Peter the Great, the flagship of the Northern Fleet. In the underfunded Russian Navy, a live cruise missile launch was a rare event, making the crew nervous. They knew Russia had a secret history of mishaps with such weapons. In 1989, on the Komsomolet submarine, flammable material ignited in a missile launch tube. An emergency blow brought the submarine to the surface, but its nuclear reactors were shut down. Fire destroyed the helpless submarine, and it sank, killing 41 sailors. When the cruise missile was safely launched, the Kursk disappeared into the ocean again. It could remain undetected underwater almost indefinitely thanks to its nuclear heart. Reactor operations were overseen by Alexei Mityaev. It was his first mission on the Kursk, but despite his lack of experience, Alexei was well aware of his formidable responsibilities. At the slightest sign of an accident, he would need to isolate himself in his compartment and share the reactor's fate. Saturday, August 12th, the second day. The Kursk was ready to start the final stage of its mission launching two practice torpedoes at the enemy battle group. It was now 11 a.m., and the commander ordered torpedo tube number four to be prepared for launch. The crew was excited the Kursk had not launched a torpedo in about two years. The training torpedo was 65 centimeters wide, 11 meters long, and weighed 4.5 tons. The crew called these large torpedoes fat ladies. As with all training torpedoes, the warheads were replaced with weights to balance the projectiles. At 11.08, the commander decided to attack when the submarine was close to the surface. He looked for enemy ships and spotted at a distant target. Confirming it was Peter the Great, he proceeded with the plan. A single sonar ping indicated the distance to the target. He ordered the sonar to be activated to calculate the distance. During the exercise, the battle group would be attacked by six submarines, with the Kursk being the second in line. At 11.17, the commander ordered the speed to be reduced to six knots. The instruction was relayed to the propulsion control center at the aft of the submarine, where Dmitry Kolesnikov knew that such a low speed meant the commander was preparing to order the torpedo launch. At 11.20, the fat lady was finally moved into position. 
the shutter between the torpedo and the observation system was closed, and the electrical connection was established. It was now 11.27 and 30 seconds. The commander took one last look through the periscope. The Kursk was ready to launch its first torpedo at the enemy battle group. Explosion. The shockwave penetrated the command center, throwing the crew to the floor and the compartment filled with toxic smoke. The Kursk balanced on a knife edge, carrying about 100 tons of explosives, 24 cruise missiles, and two nuclear reactors. It was a few seconds away from a nuclear disaster. The explosion ripped through the torpedo compartment of the giant Russian submarine Kursk, and the blast wave traveled the length of the submarine. Despite serious injuries, the captain knew that the only chance to save the ship was to surface as quickly as possible. He ordered an emergency blow, but no one could respond. 70 meters from the explosion's epicenter in the reactor control room, Alexei Mityayev used his training. His first instinct was to check if the reactors were damaged. The novice submariner quickly realized that both reactors were operating normally. Alexei knew the reactors were separated from the hull by powerful absorptive installations and could withstand 50 times the overload. But if the Kursk's vast arsenal exploded, the absorptive installations would be useless. The Kursk could become the largest dirty bomb in history. Alexei sealed himself in his compartment, desperately trying to contact the command center. But there was no response. The air in the command center had become hot and toxic, and the commander and most of the crew were dead. Without instructions from the commander, Alexei forced himself to shut down the reactors. 11.30. A second explosion wave hit the bow of the Kursk 135 seconds after the first explosion. Alexei made the decision but was it too late? The automatic control rods jammed in the reactor core, and the nuclear reactors shut down. Dimitri and his men lay where they had fallen, awaiting the inevitable collision with the seabed. Forty seconds had passed since the explosion. Forty kilometers away, Admiral Popov, commander of the Northern Fleet, was on board the Peter the Great, observing the torpedo exercises. The ship was shaken by a powerful shockwave. Sonar operators located the source of the explosion wave. 1131. Dmitry Kolesnikov and his crew were surprised to be alive. But could the reactor still explode? Dmitry immediately inquired about the reactor status. To his relief, he learned that they had been safely shut down. The nuclear threat was averted. But Dmitry knew that now they faced a desperate struggle for survival. At just 27 years old, Dmitry Kolesnikov took command. Given the extent of the damage, the crew knew they couldn't reach the rescue capsule located at the submarine's keel. The only way out was through the rear escape hatch in the submarine's aft. 1.15 p.m. On board the Peter the Great, Admiral Popov realized that the exercises had taken an unexpected turn. Five of the six submarines reported successful completion of their mission, but the Kursk was silent. Admiral Popov decided there was no cause for concern after all. The Kursk was unsinkable. 1.30 p.m. Two hours had passed since the explosions. A sailor tapped out a special code to help rescuers locate them. Meanwhile, Dmitry Kolesnikov instructed his men to write their names and carefully recorded them. He began documenting the events that had brought them to the ninth compartment. 11.30 p.m. Twelve hours after the Kursk was shaken by two explosions, the Russian Navy finally declared an emergency. Full-scale search and rescue operations began. The Navy's submarine rescue unit was alerted. On the Peter the Great, sonar operators pinpointed the location of the underwater explosion detected in the morning. Finding the Kursk would be difficult its outer hull was covered with a 6.5-centimeter-thick layer of rubber, which absorbed sonar signals, making the submarine nearly undetectable. 4.30 a.m. After five hours of searching, the Kursk was finally located by the Peter, the great sonar operators. Monday, August 14th. News of the submarine disaster spread across Russia. The country had two modern reconnaissance submarines that could have provided crucial support to the rescue team, but they were privately hired at the Titanic wreck site, 5,500 kilometers from the Kurska. Instead, the rescue operation would be carried out by the three remaining rescue submarines, but years of neglect had left them in poor condition, and their crews lacked essential experience. Dmitry Kolesnikov and his comrades did their best to stay warm. They wrote letters to their loved ones. The eighth compartment flooded shortly after the second explosion, increasing the pressure in the submarine's rear. The water level in the aft compartment rose steadily. As the hours passed, the sailors' desperation grew. On the third day, their oxygen supplies began to run low. The sailors faced suffocating in the toxic air or freezing in the frigid waters. Dmitri and his men prepared for the worst. Thursday, August 17th. 
the small Norwegian vessel, the Seaway Eagle, with a remotely operated underwater vehicle, arrived at the site of the accident. Despite all odds, Dimitri and his men continued their efforts to survive. They wrote their last words to their families. Sunday, August 20th. Nearly a week after the explosions, a British crew succeeded in attaching a manned rescue submarine to the Kursk's aft escape hatch. The Russian crew, desperate for a miracle, found that the hatch was irreparably damaged. They realized there was no hope. Later, the notes written by Dmitry Kolesnikov were recovered. They documented the final moments of the crew. Dmitry, who had taken command and provided hope in the darkest hours, left a record of their struggle for survival. He wrote that they were still alive and that they were fighting for their lives.